All right, hello everybody. Welcome to our first set of notes um, in our unit called chemical bonding. Today we're going to be talking about ionic bonding and naming. Um, if you've heard any of these notes in class, feel free to fast forward to any part that you need to get to. Um, and as always, speed up the video so that you can listen to it a little bit faster, although I am kind of a fast talker. Um, so pause the video when you need to in order to write some things down. All right, give me just a second here. Compound review, just reminding you of a few things. When in our first unit, we talked about the difference between a compound and a mixture. A compound is um, a chemical combination of two or more elements. That means that they've bonded together. So the example I gave in class, I think was water. Water is two hydrogens and an oxygen and they've bonded together. It's not that we have hydrogen floating around and oxygen floating around, that would be a mixture, but they are actually chemically um, bonded to one another and so we call water a compound. So why do elements chemically combine? Well, from our last unit, you probably should feel pretty good about this. They're trying to achieve basically a noble gas configuration. They're trying to achieve full energy levels because that gives them stability. Elements will move electrons for them to be satisfied or more stable. So how do the electrons move? There's two ways. Today we're going to be talking about one of the ways, and then on another day we'll be talking about the other way. So the first way, and this is the one we're going to talk about in at length here today, um, is transferring electrons between two atoms. So I don't think you need to write this yet. The next slide is going to be exactly the same, only we're going to label them. So give me a minute. Transferring electrons between two atoms. So one atom is close to having a full level, while the other is close to emptying a level. So imagine, for example, on your periodic table, chlorine has seven valence electrons. It needs an eighth, eighth valence electron. So it has almost a full level, but not quite. Sodium, on the other hand, which is over here, has 11 electrons. It's got one over being like a noble gas. So it wants to get rid of an electron. So electrons are transferred from the almost empty atom to the almost full atom. So they're going to go from sodium to chlorine in order to make both um, stable or satisfied. The other way that electrons can move is through the sharing of electrons between two atoms. Both atoms, um, in this example, um, both atoms are close to having full atoms, full um, shells, sorry, um, and the electrons are shared back and forth between two atoms to make, make both feel stable or satisfied. So the first type, which is what we're talking about now, this is the same words, but now I've labeled it ionic bonding. Ionic bonding is transferring electrons between two atoms. It's called ionic bonding because they are ions. One um, atom is losing electrons and therefore has a positive charge. One atom is gaining electrons and therefore has a negative charge. Those are called ions and then they sit next to each other and that's called ionic bonding. The other type that we're going to learn about soon is called covalent bonding and covalent bonding is when the atoms um, don't fully get rid of or take electrons, they share the electrons. We're going to learn more about that later. All right, so if we were going to define ionic bonding real specifically, we would say it's a bond where the bonding electrons are transferred, not shared, between two atoms. It typically occurs between a nonmetal and a metal. Write that down. Um, these elements are on opposite sides of the periodic table. So hopefully you remember that, that the metals are over here and then the metalloids go across here. And then the nonmetals, hard to do this backwards, the nonmetals are up in this upper um, corner up here. So on opposite sides of the periodic table. Covalent bonding will all take place on one side of the periodic table. So that's a way that you can tell the difference. The metallic elements are close to emptying a level. The nonmetals are close to having a full level. So they're going to transfer. The electron is going to be transferred from the metal to the nonmetal. What are some characteristics of ionic bonds? Ionic molecules are bound by charge. That means that one of the atoms has a positive charge. One of the atoms has a negative charge. Opposite charges attract. So they sit next to each other. They're not actually sharing anything. It's just that they both have charges, so they sit tight. The transfer of electron creates opposite charges. The atom that gains electrons is negative, and we call it an anion. Practice that pronunciation because people screw that all up. It's got the word ion in it, and then the prefix is an. The atom that loses electrons is positive, and we call that a cat ion, not a cation. People come up with all kinds of funny pronunciation. That's a cation. Ionic bonds form crystals. Think salt. Sodium is a plus one. Chlorine is a minus one. They sit next to each other. Sodium chloride is salt. 
There is a lot of attraction between one set of bonding atoms and another. And this attraction tends to create, create solids that have very high melting points. Write that down. Very high melting points. You need to know what characteristics are of ionic bonds versus covalent. And I'm teaching you ionic right now. They are brittle. Think, think salt for a moment. Can you melt salt? You can dissolve salt, but you can't really melt salt at home. Um, they're brittle. Imagine trying to bend a salt crystal. Um, they are poor conductors of electricity in the solid state. However, they become good conductors when dissolved in water. Salt water, salt water is a good conductor. All right, and then this is a nice image of just what we're talking about. And you probably saw an image like this in junior high. Notice that sodium, be really careful. Let me pause my video for just a second because the custodian's coming in just a moment. Sorry about that. The custodian came in and I needed to make sure that... Um that I had my mask on. I didn't have my mask on. Okay, anyway, take a look at this diagram. Notice that on the left, we have the sodium atom and the chlorine atom. Um, they're called atoms because they don't have charges currently. So the protons and electrons are equal. So that's an atom. Um, sodium wants to get rid of its um, outermost electron so that it can look like neon. Notice that it would have 10 electrons once it gets rid of its outermost electron. Um, but now sodium, because it lost an electron, has a plus one charge. Vice versa, chlorine is accepting that um, electron, so it has one more electron than protons, so that means it has a minus one charge. Now they sit next to each other, and the fact that they're sitting next to each other, we call that an ionic bond, just because they're super attracted to one another. No, that's not working. There we go. Okay, binary ionic nomenclature. Oh my gosh, what does that mean, KJ? Okay, binary, the prefix bi means two. Ionic refers to ions, so two ions, and the nomenclature is a fancy word for naming. So this, um, what we're going to be talking about right now is how to name um, things where the, where the ions are sitting next to each other and there's two ions and they're sitting next to each other. How do you name them? And that's what we're going to work on right now. So first of all, the positive atom is always listed first and the negative... Uh, positive atom, positive ion, and the negative one is listed second. The charges must add up to zero. If you in class have done the um, naming ionic compounds activity already, um, you're already familiar with that. Um, there are no prefixes used in the written name. Covalent bonds will have things like mono, di, tri, tetra. Um, you don't have that in ionic compounds. So that makes ionic compounds a little bit more complicated. The ending of the second element is always switched to IDE. So like fluorine becomes fluoride um, when it's the second element um, in, a, in an ionic compound. Okay, so here are some examples. Chlorine bonds with potassium. Well, let's find chlorine on the periodic table. Chlorine is over here. It's a minus one. Potassium is over here. It's a plus one. So it bonds with potassium. So what do we get? Which element comes first? Well, the one that's going to have a positive charge. So in this case, the one, the one that comes first is potassium. Then how do we name it? Well, it's gonna, we're going to change the chlorine to chloride, and it becomes potassium chloride. No prefixes. That's so important. Like, write it all over your note sheet. No prefixes. Um, because when you do see prefixes, that's a hint that you have a covalent compound and not an ionic compound. All right, another example. Magnesium bonds with bromine. So find magnesium. Magnesium is right here. It's going to be a plus two. It wants to get rid of two electrons, whereas bromine is still just a minus one like chlorine was. So you're going to have to cancel out the charges, and we're going to practice that a little bit. That's why it's MgBr2 or Br2Mg is because we've crossed the charges. That'll make sense in a minute. So which one is correct? Well, the one that has the positive ion comes first, so so um, the cation is magnesium in this circumstance. So MgBr2 is the correct. And how do we write the name? No prefixes. Turn bromine to bromide and we're done. Magnesium bromide. Next, this is what I was referencing about crossing the charges. So if you have already done this activity in class, you learned how to make ratios so that the positive cation um, is in a good ratio with the negative anion so that their charges add up to zero. 
but there's a cheat to doing that that works every single time and it's super easy. So I'm teaching you the cheat. If the charges of the ions are the same, then the ratio is one to one. No subscripts are needed. You never write a one. Um, the one is assumed. So in this case, SRS, done. You're, you don't have to put any ones or anything. This is where the crossing of charges comes into play. If the charges of the ions are different than the ratio, like a two to one ratio or a three to two ratio, um, which is shown in the subscripts, can be determined by crisscrossing the charges. What? Slow down, KJ. Watch. Just watch it and you'll get the hang of it. What compound will form if magnesium and fluorine combine? So we just did this. Magnesium is a plus two and fluorine is over here in this um, halogen column. It's a minus one. So magnesium's charge is plus two. Fluorine's charge is minus one. I'm doing this backwards for you guys, I guess. Um, so cross the charges and make those the new subscripts. What? Show us. Determine the charges of the ions by looking at the periodic table. Magnesium is a plus one. Fluorine is a minus one. I'm going to move my picture here for just a second. You could ask yourself, how many fluorine atoms that have a minus one charge does the compound need to balance the plus two charge of magnesium so the ion is neutral? That's what we did in the naming ionic compounds activity. We tried to figure out, okay, so in order to balance that plus two charge of magnesium, we'd need two fluorines with one negative charge each. And then the, you'd have two negatives and one, neg um, one positive two. They cancel each other out. Or we could just write Mg plus 2, F minus 1, and then cross the charges down below to make them the subscripts. So look at how the plus 2 has just been crossed over to the fluorine, and the minus 1 has just been crossed over to the magnesium. Do not write the plus or minus. All you're doing is saying that you would need however many of magnesium and however many of fluorine. So there's no plus or minus written there. You just write the number. So the final answer is Mg1, but the one is implied, so you don't write it. F2, look at how we cross the charges. So let's do that again in your head to make it really clear. Mg is a plus two, um, fluorine is a minus one. So right now, if we just leave it as Mg and F, it's not balanced. There's a, there's a plus two charge and a minus one charge. It doesn't equal zero. So we need two fluorines at a negative one charge each to balance out that plus two of the one um, magnesium. So if I just cross their charges over down below as subscripts, suddenly I've got the right ratio. One magnesium for two fluorines, and it adds up to zero. The, the total charge of the molecule adds up to zero. All right, moving on. Transition metals. Remember, transition metals are the guys that are in the middle of the periodic table. They go from group three up to the dividing line that cuts through the P section, the metalloids. Remember that these metals have electrons in overlapping energy levels. We're talking about your box chart here. They, they got really complicated when we got to the transition metals. Because of this overlap, the atom is often trying to fill two different levels instead of just one. That means that transition metals will often have more than one possible charge. Again, referring back to this activity that you were working on, you can see here that there's several um, different ion possibilities um, for some of the transition metals. So they're just complicated complicated, you're not expected to know them. You're expected to be able to figure them out or look them up, and we'll get to that. So transition metals. In the written name of a compound, the transition metals will have a Roman numeral that follows its name. It, the Roman numeral is basically going to tell us what the charge is, and so nothing else needs a Roman numeral because there's only one charge. For example, chlorine, chlorine is always minus one. So we don't need a Roman numeral for chlorine because chlorine is always minus one. However, iron right here, a transition metal, iron, sometimes it's plus two and sometimes it's plus three. We don't know which it's going to be, so we use a Roman numeral two or a Roman numeral three to tell us what its charge is going to be. The Roman numeral does not need to be written in the molecular formula of the compound. So like if I was going to do... Um, FeCl, I didn't need to put a Roman numeral in there. So iron chloride, I didn't need to put a Roman numeral in there, which that's not real anyway. But anyway, um, it does need to be written in the name itself. So if we're going to write out the long name iron chloride, you would need to specify which iron. 
All right, iron, here's an example. If we take iron that has a plus three charge and it bonds with chlorine. So how do we figure this out? So first of all, I just wanna remind you, um, write it down and pause this video if you need to. Fe and put a plus three, Cl and put a minus one. Now cross your charges, make them go down. You need three chlorines for every one iron that's a plus three. So the molecular formula is gonna be FeCl3. So what's the name? Well, we have to indicate that the iron had a plus three charge, so it's gonna be iron three chloride. And IDE notice is still the ending. All right, copper, this is another example. Copper with a plus one charge bonds with oxygen. So copper is a plus one. Oxygen, you look it up on the periodic table. Oxygen is right here. It has a minus two charge. Um, so cross your charges. And so you would have for the molecular formula, Cu2O. And then for the name, we have to indicate that it's copper with a plus one. So it's copper one oxide. Copper can have a different charge. So in this case, it's copper one oxide. Something that could totally fool you, it would be really easy to accidentally write that it's copper two oxide. But remember that this two here came from the minus two of oxygen that was crossed over. So it's not indicating that copper had a plus two charge. It's indicating that the oxygen had a minus two charge. And that's why it's written down there. The copper had a plus one charge and its subscript is written by the oxygen or implied by the oxygen. All right, last section, polyatomic ions. Um, very, very important that you understand and you should always have your periodic table close to you on the back side where it says common ions. It includes some of our just normal common ions, but it also includes some ions that are super complicated that have all kinds of letters. Those ions are called polyatomic ions. <coughs> Take a second to just look at the common ions on the back of your periodic table and look for ones like um, at the very top of the right-hand column, acetate, CH3COO with a minus one charge. That's an example of a polyatomic ion. The prefix poly means many, so it's implying that it has many elements joined together. A polyatomic ion is an ion formed of more than one type of element. So there's at least two different types of atoms in a polyatomic ion, but the whole thing acts like one ion all by itself. Even though it's got several atoms, it acts like just one ion and it has one charge. The whole group of them has one charge. So the acetate that's at the top of your page paper right here, the top of your paper on the left column, um, that's that whole long thing just has a charge of a minus one. It all works together. These types of ions are typically unsatisfied covalent bonds. I know you don't know what covalent bonds are yet, but just trust me that acetate, the carbon and the three hydrogens and the carbon and the oxygen, oxygen they're sharing electrons with each other but the whole thing is a minus one charge. So they're sharing electrons with each other, so they're covalently bonded to each other, but they're acting like a single ion. And they're listed on the back of your periodic table, and don't worry about this one. All right, polyatomic ions have names that are different. So instead of ending I-D-E, they end A-T-E or I-T-E. So take a look at them right now and see if you can see some of them that are end in A-T-E or I-T-E. That's an indicator that it's a polyatomic ion. They don't always end that way. <coughs> so take a look at um, the second one on the right column. It's called ammonium, N-H-3, I think, right? No, N-H-4, sorry, N-H-4. <coughs> Unfortunately, it does not end ATE or IT, so it's a rule that's meant to be broken. Um, when writing the molecular formula, you still make the charges neutral. So the whole thing acts like an, one single ion, and then you just cross your charges just like you always have. If a polyatomic ion needs to be multiplied to make the charges neutral, in other words, when you cross over the charge, you need four of the polyatomic ion, then you have to put it in parentheses. You put the whole polyatomic ion in parentheses and then write the subscript off to the side. When writing the name, do not change the ending of a polyatomic ion, just use it as listed. So remember, let's, let's try this. Remember that chlorine becomes chloride when it is part of a, when it's part of a, when it becomes an ion and it's part of um, 
of an, yeah, when it's part of one of these molecules. Blah, blah, blah. Um, so it ends IDE. But then there's some things that are called chlorite and chlorate. And you can actually see them right here on your periodic table. So there's chlorate, chloride, and chlorite. Um, chloride is just chlorine all by itself. Um, chlorate is ClO3 with a minus one, and chlorite is ClO2 with a minus one. Um, so just use with the polyatomic ions, just use the ending that it has on your gold sheet and you'll be good to go. Let's try a few examples. So let's try calcium bonding with nitrate. Now be careful, what would nitrogen be if it was just nitrogen all by itself and not a polyatomic ion? It would be nitride. So this is nitrate. So look up nitrate on the back of your periodic table. Calcium is, um, calcium is found here on your periodic table. So it wants to give up two electrons. So it's a plus two. And when we look up nitrate, nitrate is a minus one. We're going to cross the charges, and when we cross that plus two from the calcium over to the nitrate, that means we need two nitrates. Well, it's already NO3, so let's put parentheses around it and then put our new subscript two. So this is what it's going to look like. So cross the charges again, but put parentheses around the polyatomic ion. Watching, we're crossing over the um, crossing over the charges, and it becomes calcium, and then in parentheses nitrate with the two on the outside. So nitrate is still NO3. It's like a a blob that doesn't change at all. Now, how many of those blobs do you need? You need two of the NO3s, and that's why you have the parentheses and then the two on the outside. How do you write the name? Well, it's still nitrate. You don't change it at all. So it's just calcium nitrate. Let's try another example. Iron, okay, that's one of our ones we just learned about. That's a transition metal, and they told us it's a plus three, so that means it's going to be iron three in Roman numerals when we write out the name. Bonds with a carbonate. So if it was just carbon, it would be carbide, which never happens. Well, pretty much never happens. Um, when it's carbonate, we have to look it up on the table. So carbonate is right over here. So carbonate has a minus two charge. So iron with a plus three, cross that over to the carbonate. Carbonate with a minus two, cross that over to the iron. Find carbonate on your list, cross the charges. The molecular formula is Fe2, so the crossed over charge, and then CO33, and we've crossed over the charge from the iron. Now remember that we have to use the Roman numeral here, so it's going to be iron three and then carbonate. All right, the, this screen I pulled from the internet, you should just pause the video and take a moment to look um, at how these worked out. So if you combine calcium and nitrate, I believe that's nitrate and O3, yeah, nitrate. If you, if you um, cross or uh, um, chemically combine <laughs> um, calcium and nitrate, what is the formula for that? And so cross over the charges and it shows you how to do it. And it's got all kinds of possible weird permutations of this. So um, look at the one down below, Mg plus two and um, carbonate, is that carbonate? Yeah, minus two. Um, Notice that they simplified the ratio. So if you cross the charges, it would be plus two and minus two going the other way. Um, but then they simplified it to a one to one ratio. So MgCO3, not Mg2CO32. They simplified it. All right, finally, this is a practice. I'm going to suggest that you pause the video, try to write all the answers down, and then come back when you're done and check your answers. Um, for the first six, I want you to write the name. So write out the whole name. And then through, for seven through nine, I want you to give me the molecular formula. So let's try that. All right, so the first one, go ahead and pause the video. And now we're going to start back in. So hopefully you've tried these already. So the first one is titanium iodide. We changed iodine into iodide because it's the last one. The next one is sodium carbonate. Notice that carbonate is a minus two. So we put a two by the sodium, but sodium is just a plus one. So we didn't cross any charge over there. The next one is sodium Wait a minute, KJ, it's got three letters. I'm so confused. That's because sodium is a cation all by itself. And then OH is a polyatomic ion. Find it on your chart. 
OH is hydroxide. That's sodium hydroxide. All right, now the next two, four and five, they're both irons and they're both combining with chlorine. Notice that one is FeCl2 and one is FeCl3. Why would that be? <gasps> because iron is a transition metal and sometimes it's a cation that's a plus two and sometimes it's a cation that's a plus three. So in this case, to give the name correctly, we would say it's iron two chloride and the other one is iron three chloride. Chlorine had a minus one charge, so its charge, it's just Fe1, um, which we didn't have to write the one, it's implied. All right, and then the next one is lithium phosphate. Phosphate has a minus three charge, so we cross that over to the lithium. Lithium is a plus one charge, so there was no need to write anything with the phosphate. All right, next, lead two. The Roman numeral tells us that this example of lead has a plus two charge, and sulfite, not sulfide, but sulfite, I have to find on, my, on the back of my periodic table. And sulfite is SO3 with a minus two charge. So it's a plus two and a minus two. So they cancel each other out and we don't have to write any extra subscripts or anything like that. All right, beryllium chloride. Beryllium, BE is a plus two. And then chloride, IDE, tells us it's just chlorine all by itself. And chlorine is a minus one. Across those charges, BeCl2. And the last one, gallium, that's one we don't see very often in this class. Whoops, right there. Gallium um, is a plus three. And nitrogen, ooh, look at that. It's nitride, not nitrite, not nitrate, but nitride. That means it's nitrogen all by itself, not a polyatomic ion, just nitrogen. Um, and so nitrogen is a, <clears throat> excuse me, minus three, and gallium is a plus three, so they cancel each other out. All right, cuties, that's it. I hope this didn't take too long. I hopefully you were able to go fast forward through it. Let me know if you have any questions.